Let's uh, open our Bible um, to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, we won't read the whole chapter, but we'll pick it up in uh, verse 19. And uh, uh, this is after Paul's conclusion that in Romans 1, 2, and the beginning of 3, that there are three groups of people, and I should say they're on a continuum. Uh, you have the uh, immoral crowd, you've got the moral, non-religious crowd, uh, this primarily made up the, the Gentiles. And then you, we have the Jewish crowd who was religious and moral. And uh, it's interesting, if we were to carefully look at this, everyone is looking down their nose at the other. And Paul said, forget it. We're all under sin. And uh, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter how nice you have been uh, in your life. God declares that we're all under sin. And so how is salvation provided? Let's look at verse 19 and we'll see how it's not and then how it is. Verse 19, now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So the whole Old Testament is looking forward to uh, the coming of Jesus Christ. Verse 22, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference, no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation or a satisfactory payment through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. So what Paul is saying is that when Jesus Christ died on the cross and made the, uh, the payment for sin, he paid for all sin, past, present, and future. It's uh, encouraging to know that if you sin, and you probably will, tomorrow, no, today and tomorrow, uh, that Jesus Christ has paid for that sin already. And uh, this is the point that he's making uh, verse 26, to declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law or what principle is boasting excluded? By the principle of works? No. Uh, but by the law or principle of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith or the Jews and the uncircumcision, the Gentiles, through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid we establish uh, the law. Let's pause for prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are willing to send your Son to pay the price, the penalty that a just God demands of sin, 
that you paid that penalty, a penalty that we could never pay ourselves. We thank you uh, for that. We think of this season, this Christmas season, when uh, we see signs that say Jesus is the reason, and we just pray that we would understand why uh, this season and that it could be used to remind us of that great gift that you have sent in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we, we just uh, commit uh, not only this uh, uh, morning to you, but also next week as we uh, think of the Christmas program. And, and uh, usually there's people who will come to see the children uh, who may not know Jesus Christ is their Savior. We just pray that through the effort that's put forth, that the gospel... Uh, the reason Jesus came would be clear and that people could believe and understand that it's through faith that we are made righteous and, so, uh, and not by our works. And so we thank you uh, for this, uh, this and every opportunity to declare that great message. We want to uh, remember those among us who physically aren't doing too well. We thank you for those who are feeling better, and uh, we know that there's uh, a few uh, people that aren't here this morning because of uh, the flu or colds or other illnesses. Uh, we just commit each one to you, and we uh, think of those that are on the prayer request list. We pray for the, uh, or we thank you for the uh, uh, improvements and uh, we just pray that uh, in your grace, uh, people could uh, recover physically. And so we, we pray to that end. But if not, we just uh, pray that hearts could be encouraged and that through it all and through the sufferings that we go through, that Jesus Christ could be glorified. Uh, and so we, we pray for that. We also uh, don't want to forget our country, the leaders of our country, uh, we know that, that the Word of God and biblical principles are not a priority today. But we just pray that in your grace you could preserve the liberties that we've enjoyed in the past and that we could be, as responsible citizens, uh, use those liberties to bring honor and glory to the very grace of God that we would uh, not abuse the liberties on ourselves, but rather... Uh, use our liberty uh, to be the light, the testimony that you would have us be, realizing that the only hope of this world lies in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as we see uh, that day approaching and as we're looking at judgment this morning, that we would understand that in your grace you have provided a deliverance from the wrath of God which is to come. And so we thank you for this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
morning again, let's open our Bibles to 2 Peter. And I was thinking 2 Peter chapter 2 is not exactly a Christmas uh, message that we think of, but it might be closer than we think as we think of uh, the reason that Jesus Christ came, and that was to take our judgment uh, for us. And what Peter is doing is he is reminding us that there is a judgment that will come. Uh, we noted in the first three verses that uh, uh, the uh, false teachers, uh, false teachers that came just like in the Old Testament, there were false prophets. Today in the church age, there will be false teachers. In fact, one of the interesting observations is this, is that wherever truth and the Word of God, and by the way, when we talk about truth, uh, this is the truth. Uh, I am not the truth. You are not the truth. Uh, we can be only as truthful as we line up with the Word of God. And so it's the Bible that is the truth. And wherever the Word of God is opened and taught, there will be a perversion of that that will come in alongside. And uh, that's the idea that we have in these verses, that error comes in alongside. I, I uh, think I mentioned the other day that a false teacher is not going to stand up and say, especially at Christmas time, that uh, the coming of Jesus Christ is pointless. Nobody's going to say that. What they're going to say is the coming of Jesus Christ has a different meaning than it truly has. And uh, it will sound good. Uh, the death of Christ, uh, uh, often, especially in, in so-called evangelical or in churches uh, that are uh, claimed to be Christian, uh, you aren't going to hear somebody stand up and say, you know what? Jesus was an idiot for going to the cross. The cross means absolutely nothing, and anyone who believes in the cross is crazy, so listen to me. Oh no, uh, it's not going to be presented uh, that honestly. Uh, what's going to happen is, is that right next to the cross, air is going to be brought in. And the meaning of the cross uh, will be distorted. It'll be some kind of a martyrdom uh, uh, reason for Jesus Christ to come, to give us an example of how we should be willing to suffer. Well, I'm going to tell you this. Your suffering does not pay for sin. There's plenty of things that we can learn through suffering, but it's only the suffering of Jesus Christ when he died on the cross. He's the only one who God took all of our sin and laid it on him and him alone. Uh, he didn't lay your sin on me. And he didn't lay my sin on you. He took all of our sin and laid it on his son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross, and as he hung on that cross, uh, God the Father turned his back on his own son. And Jesus Christ screamed. It was so painful uh, for him. And as we, we think of, of uh, his final words before he dismissed his spirit, he said, it is finished. Paid in full. And our sin has been paid for. And it's interesting as we uh, look at the, uh, uh, the content of the false teachers. If you look at verse 1, it says, But there were false prophets among the people, past tense, even as there will be, or shall be, present tense, false teachers among you who privately or sneakily, uh, cleverly shall bring in damnable heresies. Now get this. Even denying the Lord that bought them. Now later in the passage, we're told that these teachers are going to be eternally condemned to hell. And here we see that Jesus Christ paid for their sin as well. Now I know there are those who believe that uh, Jesus only died for 
the people who are going to heaven. He chooses certain ones to go to heaven and he only dies for them and he doesn't die for the people who are condemned to hell. According to this verse right here, Jesus died for these people and they deny the work that he's done. It's very interesting that when Jesus Christ came and paid the penalty for sin, uh, he was a propitiation for who? John, 1 John chapter 2 uh, tells us this, that he was a propitiation for our sins. The word propitiation, we saw it in Romans this morning, means a satisfactory payment. He was a satisfactory payment for our sins. But not only ours, but for the sins of the whole world. And as we stop and we think of what Jesus Christ did on the cross, he made forgiveness of sins possible for every person. And it's through faith. And oh, I'll tell you what, it is um, uh, so difficult. Uh, In fact, salvation, Jesus did all the work and he provides it for us. And it's so easy, it's hard. We just can't grasp and get our head around it that, that you mean, all, uh, there is nothing I can do to contribute to the finished work of Jesus Christ? No, there is nothing you can do. Oh, come on. I'm better than so-and-so. Um, and shouldn't they have to shape up a little bit and be a little bit like me? And then God's love will, will come and they can get saved? No. There is nothing you can do. It is through faith and faith alone. Uh, We have on the wall, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And as we think of boasting, uh, the idea is this. There is nothing you can do. Uh, Can you imagine getting to heaven? And uh, uh, and I'm going to tell you this. Based on the word of God, I'm going to be there. Because I've trusted Jesus Christ is my Savior. He is the only way. And if you've done the same, you're going to be there too. But you know, there might be uh, somebody here who uh, knows that uh, I can be a stinker. And we're going to get to heaven. You're going to look at me and say, Tom, I'm surprised to see you here. What are you doing here? And I'm going to say, well, why should you be surprised? Look at all the good work that I did. And this verse is telling us there is nothing I can point to that I have done that is going to earn my way into heaven. The only thing I can do is say, yeah, it's surprising to see me here, but it's all because of him. And I'm going to point to Jesus Christ. He is the one that makes our salvation possible. And, and it's so difficult, especially for the religious Pharisee type, to think that they don't have at least a little foot in the door because of who they are. Paul bends over backwards that all have sinned, that there is no difference uh, between Jews and Gentiles. Listen, we are all in the same boat. And that boat needs uh, to be rescued. And Jesus Christ, when he came, he provided salvation. He He provided a rescue boat for everyone who was in the sinking ship. And that's that's all of us. Well, the uh, uh, we looked at the impact in verse two. Uh, Many will follow, and the truth will be evil spoken of and the method of the false teachers is going to be uh, smooth words uh, deceptive words Uh, and uh, I would say this if you um, ever watch religious TV and uh, I do once in a while just to see what's going on and I'll, I'll tell you this if you watched some channels all day and listened to every preacher that was on them and believed everything they all said you would be totally confused 
you would feel like a yo-yo. And uh, uh, they contradict each other. Uh, they uh, uh, come up with different ideas. And in fact, I just, I just heard a preacher say that he heard a preacher. And uh, he was an old friend of mine. And he says, yeah, I couldn't believe it. Uh, this passage in 2 Peter, uh, he talks about just lot. And so the preacher says, you see that? Uh, hey, look at it. You're in 2 Peter. He says in verse 7, and he delivered just lot. And, and the guy says, that means just Lot and no one else. Okay, you got to... Un unbelievable. Well, there was a few other people that were saved with Lot, so it wasn't just Lot. That's not the word there at all. The word there is justified. And... Uh, and so Lot was justified, and we're going to take a look at that, that that is an amazing um, uh, story about Lot. Well, uh, he then uh, says this. In verse 4, he says, for, and that little word for kind of connects the next thought with the first three verses. There is judgment coming because of uh, uh, this false teaching. And it's, there's judgment coming for more than just the false teachers. But the false teachers will be judged. And then uh, what happens is Peter gives us uh, three examples. In verse 4, he talks about angels. And then in verse 5, he talks about the world before the flood. And uh, we took some time to, to look at that. And then... In verse 6, he references Sodom and Gomorrah. Verse 6 says, And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them, now get this, an example unto those that after should live ungodly. And as we stop and we think of Sodom and Gomorrah uh, being an example, it's interesting that if we were to look back at Genesis chapter 13, uh, we would find, and uh, we, we certainly could uh, turn there to Genesis chapter 13, and uh, I've got a lot of references as an example here, so for sake of time, uh, we won't go through all of them. But as we um, think of this, um, and I'll, I'll just pick it up in verse 10. Now, what's interesting is Moses is writing an event, or writing about an event that happened about 500 years before Moses wrote it. And, uh, of course, he's writing under the inspiration of Scripture. And so 500 years, roughly, uh, after Abraham and Lot separate, and Lot sees this fruited plain, and it jogs Moses' memory as he's writing this down. That, ooh, Sodom and Gomorrah is the place that was destroyed. Let's look at it in verse 10. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. And then we have this phrase, before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, if we read the verse without that phrase, it might help make a little uh, sense here as we look at the next comments. So, Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere, even as the garden of the Lord. Like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zor. But he remembers something about Sodom and Gomorrah. It was destroyed. And that comes back to his mind. And it, it's interesting that Moses would do that. And as we think of the example, um, we have examples from Old Testament history. And guess what? Sodom and Gomorrah were used as the example. We won't take time to look up all these verses. If you want to jot them down and look them up later, that'd be great. But uh, Deuteronomy 29, 23. Uh, 
God is talking about the overthrow of Canaan. And he says, like Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, in Isaiah, he's talking about the destruction of Babylon. And he says, like Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, he uses it as, a, as an example. In Jeremiah 49, the destruction of Edom. And we could look all these verses up and this is what it would say. Like Sodom and Gomorrah. This destruction is coming. In Jeremiah 50, the destruction of the Chaldeans is going to be like Sodom and Gomorrah. In Zephaniah, now this is why I didn't want to look all through these. Uh, I, I, we could take a coffee break while I just found the book, all right? But uh, Zephaniah, uh, he talks about the destruction of Moab and Ammon. And you know what's interesting is that Moab and Ammon or Moab and Ammon, came from Lot, from an incestuous relationship. And, uh, and Lot is justified? Oh, my word. Um, anyway, they're going to be destroyed just like Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, in Amos, uh, some of the Israelites are going to be disciplined. And God takes out some of his own children. And he says, like Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah, as Peter says, is an example. But that's not the only example in the Old Testament. Um, all of this destruction compared to him, it's also at the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, these passages, we could take some time to look up because I can find Matthew real quickly. <laughs> all right, and uh, I, I, I trust you can too. Uh, the book of Matthew... Matthew chapter 10. And what we're focusing on this is the example of destruction, or when he describes destruction, Jesus uses Sodom and Gomorrah, so you get the point. And it uh, uh, makes you wonder, what did they do in Sodom and Gomorrah for Sodom and Gomorrah to be the, the example of destruction? And so, in uh, Matthew chapter 10, Jesus is sending out his 12. And, uh, and pick it up, he says, and I'll just uh, uh, pick it up in verse 12. And when ye come into a house, salute it. And if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it not be worthy, let your peace return to you. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words. When ye depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. Now, this is a specific instruction not given to the church today. This was a specific instruction to the 12 apostles to announce Jesus Christ as their king. We know that if we look back at uh, verse 5. Jesus says, Go not into the way of the Gentiles. Ooh. Uh, if this was an instruction for us today, then we couldn't talk to any of us because we're all Gentiles here. Are there, are there any Jews here? I mean, if you are, you're welcome. But um, uh, for the most part, I'm a Gentile. Uh, and, ooh, I would feel kind of left out and into any city of the Samaritans. The Samaritans were half Jew and half Gentile. And as ye go and preach, uh, but rather, verse 6, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. This is very Jewish. And when Jesus came, he came to be the king of the Jews. And at this particular juncture, he is telling the disciples, you go and give the nation of Israel. Don't even talk to those Gentiles. You tell them that their king is here. And if they don't listen to you, you shake the dust off your feet. In Old Testament, uh, 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 how, how can I put it, metaphor uh, that uh, uh, would indicate you've left them alone. You're done with them. And, uh, but, and, you leave, and verse 15, Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable 
for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah. Oh, that's interesting. Jesus, years later, almost 2,000 years later, makes reference to Sodom and Gomorrah uh, as an example of the judgment that's going to come upon Israel that rejects Jesus Christ as their king. That is uh, an amazing uh, statement that Jesus makes. Well, we're still in Matthew, so turn over to Matthew chapter 11. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 24, uh, we read this. And he's talking about, again, Jewish cities. And he lists some Gentile cities, and I'll pick it up in verse 21, Woe unto thee, and uh, Chorazin, woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon. Now Tyre and Sidon are Gentile cities. Those first two are Jewish cities. And where did Jesus come? He came unto his own and his own received him not. Jesus didn't go to Rome and perform miracles. He went to Israel to perform miracles. And they had an Old Testament that said, when this man comes, here's what he's going to do. When your Messiah comes, here's what he's going to be like. Here's what he's going to do. And he came and did exactly what the Old Testament said he would do. And guess what the Jews did? They said, no way, he's not the one. In fact, uh, Orthodox Jews today deny that Jesus Christ was their Messiah. And one of the messages that the, the church today can bring to the people of Israel, that Jesus Christ, our Savior, is your Messiah. He's your Savior too. And if you trust him, you can have salvation and have a future that God has promised the nation of Israel. And uh, so far today, very few Jews have, have uh, uh, how can I put it, have bought that message. I've had the privilege of listening to a few Jews who have, and their testimony and their message is just wonderful. It, it, it gets you almost emotional to hear them describe how they, out of the Old Testament, came to realize that Jesus Christ is the one. And their ancestors crucified Jesus Christ, and through that crucifixion, they can be saved. And they get emotional, and it's, uh, it, 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 it's wonderful. But look what Jesus says here. He says, but I say unto you, verse 22, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. Why? Because I came to you and displayed myself and you rejected me. Those Gentiles, they never saw me and I didn't go to them. But thou, Capernaum, which are exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which had been done, which have been done in thee, had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. You mean Jesus Christ never went to Sodom and Gomorrah and those cities and performed miracles for them to prove to them that he indeed was the God of the universe? No, he never did. But he did to uh, uh, Capernaum. And he says, but I say, verse 24, unto you, that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. And so, uh, what is he saying? He's saying this. Listen, judgment's coming. You know what it's going to be like? Well, you remember Sodom and Gomorrah? That's what it's going to be like. In fact, it's going to be worse than that, uh, uh, what he says. And so, uh, these Jewish cities that rejected Jesus Christ are going to be judged. And it's just fascinating that the example that's used is Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, the future of false teachers. 
uh, Jude chapter 1, and let's go back. Jude is the second to the last book in the Bible. If you find Revelation, just turn left. And Jude has one chapter. So I marked it, one. And it has 25 verses. So Jude chapter 1. And here's what we read, and we'll pick it up in, in verse 3. Beloved, when I give all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Now the common salvation here is the salvation that's common to both Jews and Gentiles. There's one gospel. And he makes reference to that. And verse 4, For there are certain men crept in unawares. Boy, that sounds like Paul's warning. It sounds like Peter's warning. Who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. In other words, uh, false teachers, the condemnation of false teachers was already planned by God. This is what's going to happen. If you become a false teacher, this is it. And uh, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, uh, self-serving, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains unto darkness, unto the judgment of the great day. Kind of sounds like Peter, doesn't it? This is Jude. Verse 7, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them, in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering or allowing the vengeance of eternal fire. And what do we see? We see that Jude makes reference to Sodom and Gomorrah as an example of future judgment. Uh, Back to 2 Peter, and in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 6, Peter does the same thing. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. And uh, I, I, I just couldn't help but bring up Sodom and Gomorrah. What an example that we have uh, of judgment. Is God going to judge? Is he coming someday? You better believe it, he is. And what's it going to be like? It's, he tells us throughout the whole Old Testament, it's going to be like Sodom and Gomorrah. In fact, in some cases, it's going to be worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. Wow. This is an amazing thing. Because Peter tells us, uh, here that he turned those cities into ashes. And so uh, this is a warning for the present day. In fact, Second Peter could all, almost be a fourth point right here. That today, judgment is coming on air. And what's it going to be like? It's going to be just like Sodom and Gomorrah. And, uh, uh, and that should cause us what? To sit up. To take a Pay attention and to make sure that the, the truth or what we're saying lines up with the Word of God. Because if it doesn't, uh, God doesn't like us to distort His Word. He doesn't like us to use His Word for self-promotion and self-gain. He doesn't like that. And He makes that very clear in this particular uh, uh, passage. Well, there's a, another uh, aspect to all of this, and that's this. Will God judge the righteous with the wicked? 
And for that, uh, let's turn back to the book of Genesis, and uh, we'll just very quickly uh, look at this particular story. And as we stop and we think of Genesis, uh, important book in the Bible, and in Genesis chapter 18, we have the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, I'm not, uh, we don't have time this morning to go through all their sin and the impact that it has, but we will. We will. And it's a very sobering thought. Uh, and as we see what's going on in this country today, and with the laws that are passed, uh, well, I, uh, I'll go ahead and I'll say this. I'll t take a couple extra minutes. When Bill Clinton was president, there was a bill that was passed, and it was called, um, oh, what was it called? Uh, Reserve Marriage Act. I, I think that's what it was. Uh, and what it said is on the federal level, that marriage would be defined as between one man and one woman. Yeah, I, I think that was the name of it. The Gallup poll showed at that time in the 90s that 26% of Americans thought that gay marriage was okay, uh, even if they weren't involved in a gay marriage themselves. Just in the last couple weeks, our Senate has passed Protect the Marriage Act, which negates that 90s bill. And what it says is, is that all marriage, to no matter who you get married to, cannot be disrespected in any way. And when the bill first came out of the House a few weeks ago, um, some guy like me, who would dare to stand up and say, uh, marriage is between a man and a woman. I would be disrespecting, and I could have been arrested for that. Well, the Senate has modified that, and they say, well, there is some religious uh, rights in it, and so uh, if a church doesn't want to perform a gay marriage, they can't be discriminated against. However, it is now going to be federal law that gay marriage will be recognized throughout the country. Uh, there's a debate that's going on, and, and the law supposedly says that if a state doesn't want to uh, recognize gay marriage, they don't have to. Uh, Minnesota does. Uh, but there's also been a long-standing principle, and this is reinforced in this bill that's, that's being discussed right now as we speak, that if gay couple gets married anywhere in the United States, even if the state doesn't approve of gay marriage, they have to accept it, federal law. So you can move. And... In the years past, if you got married in Minnesota and decided you were going to move to, you know, South Dakota or California, you didn't have to get remarried. So this becomes a complication. And Gallup and the Rasmussen did a poll among American people. Now remember, in the 90s, 26% of Americans thought gay marriage is okay. You know what it is today? 71%. I, I think about that. What is marriage? Well, we'll take some time to, to discuss that. But folks, 71%, that's not that far away from the percentage of the people in Sodom and Gomorrah who thought that gay marriage was okay. In fact, they didn't even like traditional marriage. And look what happened. Could it be that as we move away from the principles of God's word, that this judgment that's going to come on this world could be closer than any of us would like to think? 
It's very, it's very possible. Well, uh, Genesis chapter 18, I, I took a little time and let me just uh, uh, give the background of this. Um, in Genesis 18, in the first 15 verses, the angels show up and they are convincing Sarah that she's going to have a son. And in verse 16, and this is where we'll pick it up, he, uh, when they're done talking about Sarah, and this is the time she laughed, and you can read verses 1 through 15 on your own, but in verse 16, the men rose up and looked towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on their way. So here's an example of a Minnesota goodbye. So the guys are leaving uh, Abraham's tent, and he walks them out to the road, and they're looking towards Sodom and Gomorrah. In fact, that's their next point of destination. And, um, and we have a conversation with God. And so God here is talking to himself, you might say, and it's recorded for us. Verse 17, And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? So, uh, now God knows what he's going to do, but his comment is this. Should I tell Abraham what's going to happen to Sodom and Gomorrah? And he then uh, uh, goes on and says, well, seeing this about Abraham, and I'll, uh, uh, God's considerations here, he says this in verse 18. He shall surely become a great and mighty nation. And all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him. Now, verses 17 and 19 is kind of a private conversation uh, that God is actually having. And, by the way, God knows everything. Uh, this isn't for his benefit. This is for ours to trigger uh, the thoughts right here that he has in mind. For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they, sh they shall keep the way of the Lord, to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. So he's going to give direction to his family. They're going to learn his lessons. And Abraham is going to be a teacher of righteousness. Now, as we stop and we think of righteousness, uh, what does it take to be a great nation? It takes righteousness and judgment. And if Abraham is going to be the father of a great nation, he needs a lesson on righteousness and justice. And as we stop and we think um, what righteousness and justice is all about, uh, that is one of God's attributes. He is right and he is just. And one of the characteristics that we find is this, is that God loves what is right, but his justice says God will condemn what is wrong. Now, we won't take the time to look up in Deuteronomy chapter 25 because it's expressed in other passages as well, is that one of the purposes, in fact, it's expressed in Romans 13, one of the purposes of government is to do this. They are not to condemn the righteous or the ones who are right. And they are not to clear the guilty. You say, wow. Boy, are things upside down today? The guilty are getting cleared and the righteous are being condemned. That is not God's intent for government to do that. They can't do that. And so, we have an example of deliverance. And let me just, uh, in, in uh, closing here, because our, our, the, I, I'm up against the clock, you guys. And uh, so, let me, let, let me just say this. We have... In this passage, not for angels, no deliverance for angels, but for human beings we did. Noah was saved. Lot was saved. 
And as we think of Lot, and uh, we can just go back to uh, uh, 2 Peter right here, and Abraham is asked a question. And he asks God a question. Will you condemn the righteous with the wicked? And he then says, if there is 50 righteous, will you condemn the city? And by the way, Abraham is not bargaining with God. He wants the answer to the question, will you condemn the righteous with the wicked? And the answer is no. And God says, and Abraham says, well, if there is 50 righteous, would you save Sodom? He goes, yeah, I'd do that. Well, what if about 40? Well, what about 30? And he gets down to 10. And, uh, and God says, yeah, I'll spare Sodom for 10. Ooh. So that's the answer to Abraham's question. God will not condemn the righteous with the wicked. Well, as we find out, there weren't even 10 in that city. But guess what? He still condemned the wicked, but he rescued the righteous. And one of the people that he rescued, as we go back to, to uh, uh, Peter, Second Peter, was Lot. And, and I, I, I want you to catch this, because in verse 7, he delivered justified Lot, who was vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. And then look at verse 8. For that righteous man dwelling among them, in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Did you know that there is nothing in the Bible where anything good is recorded about Lot. Lot was a stinker from the day we first met him in Genesis. He was a pain in the neck to Abraham. Uh, there was strife between him. He chooses Sodom and Gomorrah. And, he, and the Bible tells us he sat in the gate, which means he was an influential citizen. And we, we also know he had a house. Now, Abraham's in a tent, not as physically comfortable. Lot is in a house. He has physical creature comforts in Sodom and Gomorrah. He then uh, sees what's going on, and it bothers him, but it really bothered him, I guess. And then when the angels show up to warn him, he offers his daughters... What's wrong with this man? And then uh, the angels have to literally throw him out of the city. They have to grab him by the nap of the neck and drag him out of town. His wife is so materialistic, she can't stand to leave her new furniture and Maytags and, and whatever she has in her house. And she has to turn around and look back. And she's judged. So him... Lot and his two daughters end up hiding in the hills while Sodom and Gomorrah is built. He has an incestual relationship, and out of that relationship comes Moab and Ammon, and they're going to be judged just like Sodom and Gomorrah. They're one of the examples that, that, that we saw. And you wonder, Lot? Lot is justified? Lot is righteous? How can that be? Well, I thought your good works proved your salvation. No, no, we don't have a problem with him. Noah was a good man. He lived his faith. Lot Lot is a loser in this life. And yet, Peter tells us he was justified and he was righteous. You wonder, how can that be? Now, I'm not uh, condoning Lot in any way, but what I am condoning is this, what Jesus Christ did for Lot. Because you see, if God is righteous and just, he will exonerate what's right and he will condemn what's wrong. 
And so what did God do? Just like with you, just like with me. The wages of sin is death, and the soul that sins, it will die. God's justice will not be violated. So what did he do? We have a substitution that comes into play. And here I am. Here is Lot, who deserves to, to have the hammer fall. And what does God do? Without violating his justice, he does this. I will be Lot's substitute. And the punishment that belongs to Lot, I will take on myself. And there was a time back in history when Abraham believed God and it was counted for righteousness. And you know what? Lot believed that message and it was counted to him for righteousness. You say, well, he sure didn't live like it. Well, you know what? Neither do most of us. Oh, I do, I do. No, you don't. We all have a lot of growing up to do. And while we may not be engaged in the same thing Lot was, and I hope you're not, we have a lot of room for growth. And when we look back and we can say with Lot, I am justified, I am sanctified, it's because I have a substitute. I can't earn my own righteousness. God gives me his righteousness. And when God looks at me, what does he see? He sees a sinner. But he sees a sinner that is in Christ Jesus. He sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And it's kind of interesting in the uh, Jesus in talking to uh, the Jews and the Pharisees are there. Uh, he says to the Jewish people, people, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you aren't going to make it. And their belief was the Pharisees were the most righteous people. They were the top of the, the mountain. Nobody could be better than a Pharisee. And Jesus comes along and says, you need righteousness better than them. Better than theirs. Where are you going to get that? Oh, we're in trouble. Yes, you are in trouble unless you have a substitute. Unless his name is Jesus Christ. And if Jesus Christ will make us righteous and give us his righteousness. Remember what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. He became sin for us so that we might become righteous have his righteousness. And that's the story of the gospel. Jesus said, it is finished. Sin was paid for. Uh, God's justice was not compromised in any way. And as a result of that, um, what do we do? We can't work. It's not of works. It's of grace. And it's through faith alone. What did Jesus say, or Paul say to the Philippian jailer? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And whoever believes on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And here we come to Peter. And Peter uses Lot as an example of a justified person. Now listen. If Lot, if the work of Christ on the cross can can take care of a stinker like Lot. You know what? He can take care of a stinker like you. And that's exactly what his death did for us. Uh, I think when we get to heaven, we're going to see some very interesting characters in heaven. Lot is one of them. You can just look at Lot, and what's Lot going to say? I, I think that's what he's going to say. It's all him. <laughs> say, that's for sure. Let's, let's bow our heads in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you again for your goodness, your graciousness, your love towards us in understanding the hopeless condition we're in 
And as we see a person like Lot, who was a jerk all through his life, and yet, because you died and paid the penalty for sin, even Lot can be justified. Even Lot could have your righteousness. We pray that that would encourage us as we look around us today and we see the degradation of our culture, that we would understand that where there's life, there is hope. And Jesus Christ's work on the cross is big enough, is good enough to pay the sin penalty for everyone. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's...